and it is my honor and my privilege today to introduce one of my mentors, one, oops, one of my teachers, um, and uh, such a special, special woman, Reverend Dr. Martha Creek, welcome. Um, Martha is widely known in New Thought. Uh, she is ordained in religious science and divine science. She has served as a ministry consultant, has been on faculty at Unity Spiritual Institute. She offers trainings and workshops, um, and she is in great demand as a guest speaker and workshop facilitator for boards, conferences, and spiritual communities. So we are very grateful, Martha, to welcome you back and that you said yes. Martha approaches deep inner work as an adventure with a sense of curiosity and wonder. She's a master of the right questioning and she calls forth the most stubborn and self-defeating patterns in us all to create a new way of being. And Martha is also a lifetime member of the affiliated New Thought Network. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Blessings to you all. It's an honor, such an honor for me to be here in service. My mission in ministry and in the world as a ministry is to serve those who serve. So I speak it again. I also speak it to establish why I'm here today, which is to serve those who serve. And I absolutely believe it's you in spades that the changes that we are creating and causing and making through our own soul's evolution and that of the evolution of humanity is a, um, a privilege for us to do. And, and in my view of responsibility that I have and that we have to be part of causing and creating the world, a new way of being in the world and a world that we all know is possible and that we move forward in that today together. So deep bow to each and every one of you and Godspeed. And if ever I can support you in any way, get directly in touch with me, marthacreek.com. My email's there, the phone number's there. And the topic today is really close to my heart. It has been now for several months. So I have referred to this and spoken about it actually regularly because of the relevance uh, it has, the um, also the hope that it has, and the assurance that this is the reality of the lay of the land, the reality of nature, and inspired to me through my readings and contemplations and Richard Rohr is where, where this conceptually came to me. So the notion of order and order we love. Most of us love order. We do a lot of effort to keep things in order, get things in order, keep them in order, get the ducks lined up and a lot of um, demand for order, a lot of expectations around order. And in some cases for me, a lot of dependency on things getting in order, staying in order and being in order. And it's absolutely sane and sensible. We're innocent in wanting that. And it's also insane and nonsensible and delusional to think that it's going to be always in order that things are going to go as i prefer or as i expect or as i prayed for so julian of norwich said it as first the fall and then the recovery from the fall first order and then disorder, and then the recovery from the disorder. All are of God, all are of nature, all are part of the universal processes. Some of us, raise your hand if it's you, like to keep everything in order. We're not, even though we say we like change, we don't really like change unless it's on our terms. And then if we can be the one that makes the chains and we're all about it versus there's a, some part of us that's really scared about change. It actually triggers our survival instincts, which we're biologically hardwired for survival. 
So any type of change represents a threat, a perceived threat to this. So it's relatively easy and innocent to be triggered by change. Certainly a lot of change or quick change um, or change that comes when we weren't prepared or weren't expecting it. Although life has taught us since recorded history that circumstances all change. This is good news. Just like in the song, it said, hang in there. This too will change. This too will change. Circumstances come and go. Situations rise and pass. So do people. So do relationships. So do those dearest to us. Rise and pass. Come and go. And life will not stop, does not stop for anybody or anything or any situation. Not only does it not stop, it's seemingly moving kind of fast. Have you noticed? Like that time of a rapid change. We even say, where did the month go? Where did the year go? Where did the decade go? Oh my gosh, how did we get here? And now, so there's some sense of us, a new level of awareness that it's, it's, even feels like it's rushing. Life is rushing to a degree. And, and that includes from a calm, still time to quite chaotic, to quite disturbing even in just a matter of seconds, this quick. This also happens in you and me to some degree and certainly in people every single day. It's happening right now in some of our lives and some other people's lives right now in this very moment. And sometimes in the shortest split second, time changes the direction of our lives. Time changes the choices we make. Time changes the, the priorities we set and hold. And what seems can seem innocuous, even a decision can rattle our whole world. Even like we say things like the rug was pulled out from under me, like a lightning struck, like the world as I knew it is, is, is over now, is different. So as entire lives have been swiveled, flipped upside down and for better and worse, for better or worse, for better and worse, both and of in unpredictable events, we know from our own spiritual practice that there's a part of us, an infinite eternal part of us, that even through these losses and changes and the disorder that we feel that there is a part of us that is less affected by this that knows oneness that knows infinity that knows eternity and that knows even in the sense of a perceived threat there's a part of me that is immune from that a part of me that knows this will rise and pass and a part of me that is an innovative, resilient, filled with grit, an open mindset to say, how will we be in this? How can I be with this? So instead of OMG, OMG, what am I going to do? OMG, what are we going to be? It's like, I don't know what we're going to be, but I'm going to do everything I can to cause and create toward what I want to see be, what I want to see become. So we are not helpless in these times. Even though we didn't ask for them, we didn't expect them, we don't delight in them, I do not love them, I do not like them. It's in these times that we are not helpless. We can and have an innate inherent power to take action, sensible, sane action in every situation or circumstances, even as they're rising to pass. So we are not helpless in these situations. And 
the changes are going to come. We cannot stop that. We cannot help that. And what we do in relationship to the changes holds all the power in the universe. How we are in the change, how we are in the losses, in the disorder is going to cause and create a, um, a sacred opportunity, a divine opportunity for us to be part of and responsible for able to respond, response able in whatever's happening to uh, move forward and toward what is actually important to us and what matters to us and to be a part of um, after we've been led out of our quote normalcy, we're led now through disorder and dismantling of an older way of being into a new, more open space that Brene Brown refers to as the messy middle. We're in the messy middle. So we know that won't work. We know that was, we know that has been, we know where we are and we don't yet know what we're becoming yet. So the messy middle of this, that there is pain in that at times or suffering in that. Think about labor labor like we don't know what's going to happen but we know i'm not going to have an embryo i'm not going to be nine months pregnant anymore and i don't know what the baby's going to become and what it's going to grow into but there's going to be pain and passing that baby through that small cervical opening out into the big world and yes there'll be some pain to our own birthing and our own rebirths as we accept the order and the disorder and then the reorder and if we're not willing at some level for this reality then it's going to be a lot more suffering a lot more pain and a lot more resistance and digging our heels in so some of this pain can be optional as we open to a willing willingness of thy will be done i will do then everything i can toward contributing to a new order of things and to be to serve I believe for us that are called in this way to serve in the role of a prophet a prophet that can lead us into the next best iteration lead us into the best next expression of this into a sacred space that knows that deconstructing the old way in the old space is divine nature is divine wisdom and that we then are here to uh, teach ourselves and each other when possible how to live more faithfully and fruitfully inside of this progression, inside of this evolution, especially when it's very, very scary. And to accept it is and will be very, very scary at times. And we are still deeply through our spiritual practice able to reconnect ourselves, realign ourselves to the infinite, to that which is real and larger and deeper than we are in our human aspects, and to be part then of light shedding, to move forward to what is being birthed, is what's coming, and a new sense of order, a new sense of being, a new way of being, literally, Eckhart Tolle refers to it as a new earth, being part of creating the new earth, the new way. So most of us are somewhat dependent on homeostasis, balance, keeping it all in order. And the dismantling of it requires a new stasis, a neostasis, a new way of being. And it's not... Um, we're not yet oriented, particularly in our ministries and the way we serve ministries to what that new way of being in ministry is. We know the old way has been dying and declining for, for decades now. And then this new way of serving ministry through hybrid, through um, not just a Sunday service, through groups and small groups and conversations and music and message is absolutely going to be required for our sustainability and long and, and thrivability in the future. 
So just as we needed, though, first, a sense of order, we needed the container, a container for that. And if to stay, though, in that same container is dangerous if we try to stay there too long, like old new wine and old skins. I mean, we've been we've been cautioned about this. It is also self-serving at times to keep us small like this. And it's 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 natural to want to to a degree if we're scared by what the next may be or what the unfolding picture may show us. So order will be deconstructed by the trials and nature of life. We must go through a period of disorder to renew, to rebirth, to actually grow up, to actually grow ourselves, to expand. And then only in the final reorder stage, which is not final, it's cyclical. So order, disorder, reorder. And then only in the last, the, the, the third third stage of the reorder can darkness and light both exist the old and the new both exist and paradox can be okay that we live with a foot in each world and split in the middle at times and to land on that we're finally home to ourselves and finally home in a world that never actually existed, that was always in motion, that was always changing, that was always dying, that was always blooming, always becoming, and awake now as spiritual beings awake to the Alpha and Omega, the birth and the death, the old and the new, the what was the what is and what is becoming and to live in the reality of that is what is wholeness. That is what is oneness, not one or the other, but the both and. And it will then require us to have our deep in our spiritual practices of what is true, what is actual, what am I believing here? What are the consequences of what I'm believing to absolutely accept and integrate that death is part of life, not just theoretically, not just as a platitude, that failure, failing is a part of success, that failure is a part of victory, of trying things. We're in a laboratory to test things, to see what would work and what wasn't, what didn't work. And that imperfection or our so-called imperfections is included in divine perfection. Imperfections as perfection. And that opposites exist. They also collide. And everything belongs. Everything is included no exceptions. And until I include everything, I'm going to suffer more and more and more. So pain then is a teacher. Don't have to love pain. Don't have to like pain. It would be very masochistic uh, to do that. And pain is included. Pain is a part of it. And for us, for me, not to dismiss pain so quickly, so easily, or seek to be distracted from it, just to maintain or some illusion that I can hold this order in place, this older way, to say, no, I must accept the nature of it, the coming and the going, the rising and the passing. And I've I have to continue to be cautious about trying instant fixes and quick fixes and acknowledge myself over and over and over as a beginner, as somebody that's learning, somebody that's in a laboratory of life to see what's possible here, what could be done here, and to pay attention to what works and what doesn't. What moves me toward the way I want to be in the world and what leaves me stuck 
in the way I've, quote, always been in the world. So what will move me toward my own goals for my life, for my jobs, for my profession, for my family, for my relationships? And doggone it, there is no fast forward button to move us through disorder to order, back to order, or or disorder to reorder. As much as we want that, there's no direct flight for that. We've got some stopovers and we're going to have to bear some of this disorder and through our own resilience, when you think about the indigenous people, their resilience, their grit, the stamina, this uncommon motivation for what has been endured in the human form for 2000, over 2000 years since the creation, we can draw on that to draw on that uh, grit, that resilience, that faith, that that endurance, that's uncommon motivation to say, this is uncomfortable. Yes, it's not fatal. Uncomfortable, change is uncomfortable, not fatal. Disorder is uncomfortable, not fatal, even though it may feel like it will kill me at times. So far, it hasn't. So as we begin a, a new chapter today, a new chapter from this moment here going forward, a new chapter for our the way I'm going to be in the world, a new chapter for how I'm going to be in relationships, how I'm going to be in a situation differently, how I'm going to be in a circumstance differently, how what I'm going to be causing and creating out into the world, into the neighborhood, into in the places where I visit, the marketplace, the office place, wherever I am that I'm going to be in a spirit of transformation, an attitude of transformation that I'm going to put forth to cause and create every single thing possible to reorder the way that I imagine the world to be, the way that I imagine the world could be, the way that I vision a new way of being with each other, with other peoples, with other cultures, with other colors, with other orientations, so that we can learn to live in a third, more spacious place. We can learn to live neither fighting or fleeing reality, but bearing and more coherently, congruently bearing the creative tensions of the dying off and the birthing, the old and the new. We are in truly a spacious place of grace to be able to do this, a space of grace, which all newness comes. All newness will come. So think about a, a flower or a weed that will grow through concrete. Life will not be stopped. And whatever you believe about God or creator, or creation, or the universe is actually in charge. And this will either free you to hear this or frighten you. That there's something in charge, and it's not me. And I remember having that thought very clearly at about age 12. Oh, there is a director of the universe, Martha. And it ain't you. There is a director of the universe. It's not you. And as frightened as that was for a second, it's been very liberating ever since. There is something in charge and it is not me. 
See if you may even say that out loud and for yourself. There is something in charge and it is not me. I am not in charge of the universe. So just like through all of our great spiritual traditions, we have been offered this. We've been encouraged around this. The transformation that is possible, what to pay attention to, what to align with in the way of truth, capital T truth and the reality, and to be called into, to be called into, to have a, a vision that that impulses us, a vision that encourage us a vision that will also pull us forward to learn to live in this more spacious place and to accept that there will be times of tension, of creative tensions, of disorder, order, reorder, order, disorder, reorder. And there is no direct flight through the disorder. So accepting some disorder, and that's been absolutely demonstrated for us throughout our own lives, our abilities to do this, and certainly by master teachers, sages, and seers, all extraordinary leaders in the world have lived through and some died for being part of causing and creating the next greatest iteration of ourself, the next greatest iteration of the heart of humanity and the soul of humanity. We're part of that. And I believe it's a good use of us, this type of evolutionary contribution and progress. So I uplift you today in whatever way you may be in the messy middle of it or in a time of tension or disorder, to hang in there like a hair in a biscuit and absolutely know that whatever's going around is going around and it will rise up again just like it went down. So hang in there. No, you're not alone in this. There is something wiser in charge of this and whatever that is real about you cannot actually be threatened. The part of you that is infinite. Eternal. Draw on that today. All blessings for you. <laughs>